does not go along with it, does not go along with it. It is unfair. Mr. Speaker. Chris Ockenbaugh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I commend this bill to the House. Oh. 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 Order. Order. The Honourable David Cunningham. Oh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We rise to order. Order. Rise to oppose the tax excise bill, Mr. Speaker, recalling first off what it does to petrol prices. Oh, now, Mr. Speaker, when the Labour-led government left office, the total petrol excise duty was 42.5 cents a litre. It's already gone up by one fifth. It's 50 and a half cents a litre, and this bill will put it up another nine cents to 59 and a half cents a litre, raking another seven billion dollars over ten years out of the pockets of middle and lower income New Zealanders. Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, it's not enough to fund the RONS, the roads of no surplus, Mr Speaker, uh, because it has to be done in conjunction, as we said in the first reading, with a number of other measures that are required to contrive uh, what has been repeatedly described as a wafer-thin surplus. Uh, but which the Labour opposition argues is actually a bogus surplus, because you don't get there without having to simultaneously manipulate about $3 billion worth of revenue and spending measures. They're taking $200 million out of the 2014-15 operating allowance. They are refusing to give back $700 million worth of ACC levies against the advice of officials. Uh, sir, they are magicking $400 million of tax credit offsets in one year only, the year that they need to hit surplus. Uh, they are contriving a $1.1 billion increase in corporate tax receipts for that year only and a $1.1 billion increase in PAYE and employee tax uh, as well, Mr Speaker. So uh, with all of those things, sir, this adds up to a budget uh, that really is not a surplus. But I want to examine two other aspects of this today in this uh, part of the debate, sir. The first is, what is the impact on the economy and of the government's other objectives of passing this measure and the other uh, fiscal measures that it is part of? There's a thing in the economic jargon called fiscal impulse, and for the folks listening in at home, that's What's the net effect, if you like, of all the things that the government's doing here, all the taxes it takes out and the spending that it puts in? Is it putting your foot on the accelerator to make the car go faster, or is it putting your foot on the brake to slow it down? If you put money in, you make it go faster. If you take money out, it slows the economy down. The highest application of the brakes, the biggest negative fiscal impulse, is in the magic year where it supposedly hits surplus. And that is because the government is having to hold back on spending and amp up the tax it's taking and stop giving stuff back like ACC levies in order to get to the wafer-thin magic line. The net effect of that is a minus 1.2 per cent fiscal impulse. That means GDP growth is about a per cent lower than it would be if that had been neutral. All right, so the government is shrinking the size of the budget, shrinking the size of the state relative to the economy, taking energy out of the economy, and in so doing, what happens? Our unemployment rate is staying up to 6 per cent, not the 5.2 per cent that was forecast to fall to in last year's budget. That is, more people, by the decision of this government, are going to be out of jobs than need to be, and indeed more people are going to be out of jobs than they <coughs> said would be just a year ago. And that's real people, real families who've lost hope, who've lost self-esteem, who've lost income. And of course, for other taxpayers, that means they're having to pay for those families to live through the unemployment benefit when they don't need to be. So that's, that's the aggregate effect, a 1.2 per cent slowdown in, in GDP growth as a result of the government trying all these tricks to get to a surplus that doesn't really exist. Now, we agree with the idea of getting to surplus. We would do it too, but we would do it in a much more genuine way without these negative side effects uh, on the economy. I guess the third thing, Mr Speaker, that I want to reflect on today, given the enormous amount of money that we're watching the government clawing out of the pockets of ordinary Kiwis through this bill, $7 billion over three years, 10 years, sorry, 
is to ask that age-old question about fiscal and revenue policy. Who gets what and who pays what? Because at the end of the day, politics and the arguments around this chamber are very much about who's getting and who's paying. And what New Zealanders are now crystal clear about is that who's getting under this government are the top few percent and who's paying is everybody else. Mr Speaker, if we needed to uh, refresh our minds with a little bit of history back to 2010, we look at the famous tax switch where the government put up GST for everybody 2.5% and then gave the top tax rate a massive uh, tax cut. What was the effect of that, sir? It was to raise $14.3 billion in tax out of everybody else. Average income has got, income earners got $12 a week. Someone on John Key's salary got $243 a week. All right? Joe averaged 12 bucks. John Key, 243 bucks. The upper income tax cuts were not neutral. The government wouldn't have to do all the smoke and mirrors and raise your petrol tax if they had kept the promise to make this tax neutral. But in giving more to the rich and taking it off the poor, they were under by a billion dollars over four years. They were a billion dollars short, according to their own Treasury documents. But it doesn't stop there, because this debate gives us an opportunity to run through the list just to call to mind all the other sneaky little taxes that National's been up to. Mr Speaker, we've caught them out twice in the last few months. The, the car park tax, which they've rolled back off, and the, the famous iPad tax. The famous iPad tax. You know, they think it's good enough to charge uh, ordinary workers, office workers, fringe benefit tax for the private use of their work iPad or computer. You're supposed to go through and work out how much of your use of your computer is private and then pay the fringe benefit tax on that. What a ridiculous idea. The government, however, didn't have the courage to take on the guys that make the iPads, like Apple and the other big IT companies, and make them pay a fair share of cross-border tax. They can just shift their costs and they, they pay almost no tax at all. Mr Speaker, the government has forced people to pay 20 per cent higher early childhood costs, a 31 per cent average increase in school donations, 22 and a half per cent higher tertiary and post-school fees. Student loan repayment rates have gone up and ACC charges have gone up. Get this, uh, they've gone up 67% uh, on the work account, 23% on the earner's account, 31% on the motor vehicle account. Workers' ACC costs have gone up 67% under the life of this government. Officials told them they were charging a billion dollars too much in 2014-15. You know what? They said, forget it. We're not giving it back because we won't hit surplus. And I call that being unfair and not straight up with New Zealanders. What about KiwiSaver? <laughs> Mr Speaker, they put up the uh, compulsory payment on uh, KiwiSaver and reduced the tax credits. Prescription charges, just lots of nasty little things, have gone up from $3 to $5. Fuel excise has already gone up a fifth or 20 per cent under this government, and they're going to put it up another 10 cents a litre, 9 cents a litre through this bill. Tobacco charges have gone up, road user charges have gone up, local government rates have gone up, alcohol excise has gone up, aviation fees have gone up, company filing fees have gone up. Mr Speaker, the point is that this is a government that came in and gave massive tax cuts to the top 1 or 2 per cent. And then they've spent the last five years getting everybody else to pay for it. Mr Speaker, this is not good enough. This is not what New Zealanders want to see. This is not the New Zealand that we grew up to believe we had a right to live in. We thought we were going to grow up in a country where everybody got a fair shake of the sand, where the kid of a doctor and the kid of a driver could aspire to the same success in life, where it didn't matter what the size of your parents' wallet was or what your skin colour was or your gender or your orientation was, that everybody got a shot. That's not National's vision of New Zealand. And this bill is yet another bill, like all the other rubbish we've seen come through on this budget, where you New Zealanders are paying too much and the rich are getting away with too little. Mr Speaker, we need a vision, we need a positive future, we need everybody to have a stake in this country, to be proud of being New Zealanders again. We want a bit of 
positive national identity, and we're not getting it from this government that is disappointing, overtaxing, and dismally failing New Zealanders. Dr. Cam Calder. I commend this bill to the House.